Today I'm joined by Saurabh Amari. Uh, Saurabh is the op-ed editor for the New York Post and the author of The New Philistines, uh, I think the memoir from Fire by Water, and the new book, the brand new book, The, the Unbroken Thread. Uh, welcome, Saurabh. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, I think you know, but before I want to go into into the new book because that's uh, that's the the, the main uh, topic of our conversation. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about about your background, which is is quite interesting. You're also a, a little bit of an outsider of to what's going on in 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 general in Western culture, and you know, I kind of feel a bit of kinship there um, uh, because I'm I am literally outside of the West right now. <laughs> you know, doing my little pirate radio show with uh, with all the the post liberal thinkers and i'm i'm curious um how do you think um your your backgrounds influenced your your current interests and and you know the, the point where you that that you've reached at the moment sure so i was born and raised in tehran iran um i moved to the united states when i was about to turn 14. um i think as you know i've been arguing for um restoring more traditional accounts of what it means to be fully human and how we achieve, how we could really achieve true human happiness. Um, and my Iranian upbringing was mostly defined in the negative for me, um, in the sense that I obviously was, I grew up under the Islamic Republic and I came to associate all tradition, all religion with. Um, what was both an incompetent and uh, brutally repressive regime. So that when I, before I actually immigrated to the United States, I declared myself an atheist and wanted to do nothing with anything traditional if tradition meant, you know, scowling ayatollahs and judicial amputations and uh, floggings and so forth. And so I come to the West and I'm, I'm kind of reveling in what it means to be. A, a, a kind of almost the paradigmatic subject of liberal order. I've been, the fact that I'm in the West, the fact that I can choose different worldviews, choose different lifestyles is kind of a product of, of the West. And I was reveling in it. And then over the course of a long time, I mean, something, things changed. One important fact was my being received into the Catholic Church. That's a separate kind of longer story I told in my memoir. Not unconnected to this other fact that I became a husband and a father, and suddenly all that restless dynamism, all that um, kind of barrier dissolving acidity of liberalism became much more problematic for me. And so I was uh, suddenly worried about, okay, like what do I transmit to my son as a set of substantive values? How do I um, protect him against a little bit of, you know, we can all tell it's some somewhat disordered culture, disordered civilization. And so I had to, um, I had to kind of give him the thread of traditions, the book's title, um, in a conscious way. And that, I, I understand there's some tension in that, right? You're sort of like, your um, traditions should be taken for granted. And you, usually they're just part of the order continuity of who you are, and you don't think about them in a self-conscious fashion. But I argue that there's no other way that you have to try to restore them restoring them means recovering them. Um, I haven't given much thought to how that now, how I would now view my Iranian experience through this kind of very complicated lens. Um, but uh, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I think it is one of the one of the core questions uh, at the moment, kind of which which tradition, because I think that's kind of a question that I get a lot, you know, by by being also kind of an advocate of, of traditional lifestyles, you know, it, it is a good question, like, okay, so which which one, <laughs> which one are you advocating for? Uh, and it's clear that, you know, you've, you've found your home in the Catholic tradition. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's fair enough. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you think that, because um, you being kind of a convert to Catholicism, to the Western tradition itself, is it possible to love and integrate and embrace Western tradition without embracing liberalism itself? Because a, a lot of times, you know, it, these things are, are seen to be overlapping in quite a significant way. So I'm curious where, where you draw that distinction and, and uh, if, if you think that, you know, you can kind of uh, have the Western tradition cake and, and leave, the, leave the slice with liberalism out. It's a very good question. Um, very quickly on the point of um, ecumenism between traditions. 
the book um, in an attempt to tether my son to something better than just myself or just our ambient liberal culture, poses 12 questions um, that I argue poke certainty, poke, uh, poke holes in our kind of modern liberal certainties. And um, each one is explored through the life of one great thinker. I'm, I'm just a sort of journalist storyteller, I'm not a theologian or philosopher myself. So I, I couch my arguments uh, large, or anchor them, I should say, largely in narratives with a drama in each of them. They're sometimes intellectual dramas, but nevertheless dramas. And uh, only about a third are Catholics. There are also you know, Protestant thinkers like C.S. Lewis and Howard Thurman. There's Andrea Dorkin, who represents think of radical feminism as a, as a tradition. She represents that and would sit uneasily with the rest of them. There's Confucius on reality. So although that may seem like a kind of hodgepodge that is only made possible by liberalism in some sense that we can kind of pick and choose traditions, there is a kind of uh, integration or an inner integrity to the 12 questions such that, for example, um, in each of the questions that I explore, you see the working out of this paradox where something was treated as, an, as, a, as a barrier to be overcome by liberalism and that the loss of this barrier we were told would make us free. And the paradox is that once, in, only in retrospect, you see that that barrier somehow kept us free, kept us sane. So to give one example that's very easy, Third chapter has to do is what does why does God want you to take a day off? And it's a it's a phrase of the Sabbath as an institution. Central figure is Rabbi Abraham Shachar Heschel. The Sabbath, you know, Americans had a um, Sabbatarian tradition. They did the, the law should have pulled the day off, going back to the colonial era, that is before the founding of the Republic. And it was only recently, I mean, relatively recently, over the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century, that we got rid of a lot of these rules. And what we ended up with is that we're, our lives are harried, miserable. We don't have families that have time to spend together. There's just kind of a barrage of work, and, um, constant intermingling of work and play, and therefore no true sense of rest. So you see how um, something, again, something that seemed like a barrier actually preserved true freedom, or a sense that you could detach from competition, rivalry, inquisitiveness. Um, so, in that sense, the traditions are united, I, were, I would argue that the, uh, and the Catholic tradition can approach the rest of them in a coherent way because you believe that you know, God is a reasonable God and he's left the imprint of his wisdom on many peoples across many different traditions. And so um, you can find a complicated way in someone like Andrew Dworkin who would utterly reject anything to do with the church. Um, is it possible to have those traditions without liberalism itself? Or is it possible to have the West? It is very hard to imagine um, the West without liberalism now. But the way I try to think about it is to, especially from the point of view of the church, liberalism is a relatively recent phenomenon in the history of our species. It's only 200, 300 years old when it's been an operative force. And it has never been the sole tradition. In other words, obviously the, the church is this kind of instit millennial institution that's seen so many different kind of ideologies, regimes, heresies, but also other traditions that were part of the West were, were never quite ever extinguished, which makes the kind of most fanatical liberals the ones who can't even stand two years ago because life wasn't as liberal as they ever imagined it, you know, even two years ago. And so they have to constantly, there's this receding horizon of the past that they have to get rid of and new liberate forms of liberation always be staged. stage. And so, um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it takes historical imagination, but it is not impossible in a, at least on an intellectual level to separate, um, liberal order from the whole of the West that is more than the West. And many of the things that are especially cherished about liberalism, which I cherish as well, I'm here, I, so I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't have civic ingratitude, rule of law, 
um, due process, all of those have pre-liberal roots. It's this tendency among liberal ideologues to say, you know, if you imagine anything other than liberalism, you must be calling for lawlessness, you know, uh, just sort of a horrible forms of repression and so forth. But it's like, not really, you know, a lot of the stuff that we cherish about liberalism, liberalism is kind of parasitic to in some ways or has appropriated, we use that word, that's fine, but that the alternative needn't be, you know, this past that was just all horrors and, and bad things. My next question is about um, an, another assumption in our society. Um, do, do you think that, um, you know, the, the concept of progress, you know, there, there are not many things that are baked into, um, into, into the values of, of liberalism in a way, in, 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 a, uh, in a concerted fashion. Like the, the idea is that we are a value neutral society and therefore we can be pluralistic and tolerant and, and include values from, from multiple, you know, of philosophies and, and, and ways of living. Um, but progress seems to be baked into the cake. Progress is, is a value that's not, it's never questioned and there is a right side of history and you, you better be on it. And, and that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the implicit assumption. I, I'm curious what your, your personal relationship is with, pro, with the idea of progress. <laughs> well, um, my friend Patrick Deneen, whom you've had on this show, um, as you know, has written famously that one of the most urgent tests of mankind is how to learn to protect ourselves against progress. I mean, I'm sort of paraphrasing, I can't remember what the exact, but it's, it's a very kind of amusing, but also penetrating idea. Um, no, it's one of the most sort of destructive um, elements of liberal ideology. Um, the, for, I'll speak about it in two sense. One is the epistemic problem that progress raises, which has to do with the fact, and I was as much a victim to this as anyone, or I succumbed to it as much as anyone, the idea that um, what's newest must also be best. Um, C.S. Lewis calls it uh, chronological snobbery. Another term for it might be presentism, that um, there's this progression of ideas and the newer they are, the better they are, and therefore the, the further back you go, uh, conversely, the more um, error you will encounter. And um, I certainly had that worldview. I mean, when I was, I was a philosophy student as an undergrad, and I would be puzzled by why we're reading Aristotle or Plato, because we now have, you know, 20th, 20th century philosophy. You know, we have uh, what was then called critical theory, which in a kind of um, bodlerized form has now taken over our whole lives, but I was really into, you know, Foucault and Lacan and, and Judith Butler, or what have you, or, or kind of neo-Marxian thought. I was like, what, why are we reading Plato? That's, that's been debunked. No, that's been, you know, uh, the, the immortality of the soul or the idea of the, of the, of the good. These are all um, things that belong in museums. Well, why are we reading it in a philosophy course in, in the early 2000s? And so that's a, that's incredibly dangerous because and it's bound up with also scientism, the idea that um, the scientific pro progress, especially a scientific enterprise has supplanted or made superfluous older ways of knowing the world like um, speculative reasoning, metaphysics or religion. And um, so there are sets of questions that no longer get asked as a result of this ideology of progress. Um, uh, because we consider the inquiries that were associated with them to have been associated with the past, we don't need to do that anymore. So, um, you know, does is the soul immortal? That's something that reason can that, that the Greeks thought you could answer using just human reason alone without even divine revelation. You know, um, how do I appreciate a piece of art? Are there objective standards for art? Um, those are, again, those are questions that. Um, um, the ideology of progress has rendered irrelevant to us because we think that um, uh, most things can be answered by scientific inquiry and scientific inquiry takes as its object these facts, which are things we can observe with our senses, measure with scientific instruments and generally express in mathematical language. But there are sets of questions that just don't, both the questions and the answers don't take scientific form. And so, um, how are you? How are you going to? Um, 
how are you going to answer like is why is it that I enjoy a Midsummer Night's Dream as a play if it's if it's artfully performed? You can't say well because when I watch it, certain synapses fire in my brain or certain hormones uh, surge through my body. Yes, that's true. That's as a, as a, like a kind of um, how account of what it is that uh, a good play triggers in the human mind and body, but. Um, it doesn't answer the question of why is a, a Shakespeare play well performed beautiful. So this is all kind of, pro it, it is bound up with the idea of progress and it is a product of a concept of progress. That's the epistemic problem. And then the, the, the moral problem is that it, it, if you look at the past as just this series of errors and horrors, and you think that history has this progression um, where things just get better and better as time go, you you tend to ignore your own time's uh, moral failings. You know, right now with um, kind of the obsession with let's say the 1619 project, it's not that, that slavery wasn't an absolute moral evil, but to look at the past as just benighted and awful blinds you to the fact that your own generation might have moral shortcomings that need to be addressed. Um, instead, you have this weird relation with the past where um, you can't possibly relate to your own ancestors other than to condemn them rather than seeing them as, you know, a mix of light and dark and, and uh, good and bad. And there are certain things they may have gotten right, you know, uh, it just, or just because they didn't have certain scientific accounts of how electromagnetism works or uh, what quantum mechanics is, doesn't mean that they didn't get uh, other moral questions correctly. Um, so both the kind of from the epistemic and moral point of view, this ideology of progress is, is, is very destructive. And it makes us, you see the iconoclasm that it results in too. It's a, um, more and more things from the past have to be abolished, you know? So, so not only obviously the monuments to um, slavers and, and Confederate generals, but also Lincoln himself wasn't perfectly progressive in some respects. Therefore, off with Lincoln too, off with Churchill too people who are um, uh, heroes, obviously, <laughs> of authentic progress against genuinely awful things. Yeah, um, how, how much of this do you think is, um, is, is a result of our, our fascination with technology and the fact that it's essentially the, the only form of, uh, of miracle left, um, you know, because people can, you know, they, they have tangible benefits, you know, like, you know, this Zoom call is quite a, a tangible benefit of technology and it's quite miraculous. I, if, if I were to have to describe each step that, that you know, is needed for this to happen, I probably, you know, should draw the, the short straw, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Uh, and it, and it, it is, uh, it is there, there's something about that. And the idea that this is, you know, this is a product of science, it's a product of, of you know, these, these, this, this cast of high priests who, who know about these things and not everyone knows about these things. Um, and, and also the fact that uh, there are no other competing value system. So in a way you have this, this mirage that, you know, we've demystified the world and whatever is current is, you know, is, is in the era of technology and the smart people who have made the televisions and the microwaves and then the antibiotics, uh, they know about things and they also, you know, they, they've solved it. And um, it also kind of moves things that, that used to be in the moral realm, because I feel like in the era of religion, people understood that there were things there, there is, there are oughts, there are things that, that, that are separate. But now the, the illusion is that, okay, this is all science, facts don't care about your feelings, you know, let's let's go and, and find find the facts, and then that's that's the only measure of truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a wonderful book by um, Joseph Ratzinger. Late, later, obviously, he became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, called "Introduction to Christianity," and he's talking about why, at what point, what was the decisive shift from um, people mostly relying on tradition, this firm program. Uh, that you have, you've inherited from the past, the accumulated wisdom of the past, and especially revealed religion. Um, with its, by the way, its capacious con concept of, of reason. In other words, what the, what the medievals had, um, contrary to our stereotypes of them, was a very wide view of what just pure human reason, speculative reason could achieve, including proving the existence of God without relying on the Bible or revelation, just from kind of metaphysical premises that why is it that things happen in the world um, 
you, you eventually would have to get to an uncaused cause, otherwise you'd have an infinite regress of, of, uh, of causes with nothing behind them ultimately to move them um, or to cause them. So um, that was medieval reason and it was a broader, it was a, it was a very capacious, as I say, generous account of reason. Um, but Ratzinger says that the decisive kind of formula of modernity is um, uh, uh, the, the historian um, uh, Vico, and he had this formula that um, ver uh, verum, verum quia factum, truth is the maid. Everything that's true are the things that we do in history, human acts. That's what we can know well, and therefore that, that is the sum of truth. And a more, um, even more contemporary version or an advanced version of that is, is um, verum quia faciendum. Truth is um, uh, what we can make, what we can do. Um, and that's the kind of technological worldview. It's, it, you no longer need speculative reason. Every, everything kind of happens. It all works. It all works. You and I are talking on Zoom and it's this miracle. Um, uh, uh, and then as soon as we're done, I'm going to tweet this to tens of thousands of people who follow me and it all, you don't need to ask. And, but again, I would say that's an impoverished worldview because you could do all that, but you also need a a moral frame, first of all, for discerning what is, what should be, are there things that shouldn't be done just because they can be done? Should they be done? Um, um, and um, uh, those are still in need of answers and, and techno science and technology don't supply us with those answers. They don't supply us with more kind of answers to existential questions. What, why, why is it worthwhile for us to go on living? Why should we perpetuate the human species? Lots of people now say you shouldn't. You know, um, uh, uh, there are antinatalist philosophers who argue that we should just sort of go extinct as a species because we're just destructive. Um, how do you answer those? We, 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 to, to, I, I just don't know what a scientific or technological answer to those kinds of things could be. You can find answers to that in religion. You can find answers in, in kind of classical philosophy, but you can't find it in, in, in science and technology. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's hard because there are no there are no facts in, in religion. Uh, that's that's not where where the truth is to be sought. Um, uh, I also uh, in by reading your book, I realized uh, I that... have to stop. But no, yeah. there are facts in religion. I mean, there's um, uh, there is, for example, the fact of revelation. Uh, 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 so in the New Testament, disputed, revelation. very disputed. <laughs> well, I mean, sure, sure, but there are also are sorts of scientific facts that you also take on faith and the, in other words you don't um if you go to a god forbid if you have a if you're worried about let's say cancer um you rely on the authority of the physician ultimately it's not like you're going to be like no, no no i want to dispute your chart you know you or or, or the weather weather uh, 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 any on any given day when you check the weather you you're relying on the authority of of the revealer in that sense and so yeah i mean you need you need the grace of supernatural grace to be able to believe the truths of revelation or the facts of revelation um but but uh certainly plenty of them have i mean in the case of the new testament have plenty of um you know, non-christian sources that verify that there was a jesus of nazareth blah 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 but in any of those cases there's an act of faith involved in in accepting whether they're facts or not right you, whether they're true or not <clears throat> every every kind of almost everything you you t take for granted as truth you're relying on on the authority of a, of a revealer unless it's demonstrated for you immediately but that's not all of life there's plenty of things you have to take on faith yeah absolutely i've I've also had um a professor uh sergio kleinerman from from princeton on, on the show and he's a yeah kind of world leading mathematician and that was also his position to say you know any any sort of advance that that they've made and even in pure mathematics which is arguably the more you know, the, the most fact, factual or, or, you know, at, at least, you know, that gives us kind of the instinct that this is, this is reality at its, at its core. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that, you know, most of the, the, the revelations that were made in that, uh, in that space were revelations, were things that essentially kind of came to the, to the mathematician and then they kind of retrofitted that idea to what's possible in reality. So I think that's, yeah, that's, that's probably, that's probably more epiphany in, in science than, than people like to think. 
And like you said, uh, the argument from authority is probably what most people rely on 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the next thing I wanted to, to bring up is uh, I've, I've noticed in your book that we we both have a, a fascination with, with Solzhenitsyn's Harvard address of, you know, a, a world split, a split apart, um, which I thought the first time I read, it, I thought it was probably one of the most press, prescient documents ever created because he's probably the first nudger of you know post not necessarily the the first but he was definitely a red pillar at at the at that time and moment and I, it was really interesting and he was canceled for it yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting he was he was accused of being some form of like a, a dugan figure you know some some russian mystic you know that just doesn't get it he doesn't get liberalism um but he made some some interesting points and i have a little excerpt here i want to read to you and then maybe uh, get, get your position on it um so he says um i have spent uh, all my life under a communist regime and i will tell you that a society without any objective legal standard is a terrible one indeed but a society with no standard but the legal one is not quite worthy of man either. A society which is based on the letter of the law and never reaches any higher is taking very scarce advantage of the high level of human possibilities." End quote. So I'm, I'm curious what, what your position is on this, because I know you've written about it in the book. Yeah, um, so what he's critiquing there, he called it um, legalism. I would call it um, um, liberal rightsism this idea that um, uh, the, all that society should offer the individual subject and the whole of a people are a set of rights which are uh, uh, put you in competition with others and, and the law adjudicates between your rights-based claims between each other and, um, and procedures more or less for doing that. And that's, that's the whole of society. And there's no kind of a deeper moral substrate that informs how to choose between rights and how, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what, is, what is it all for? What, is, what do we aim at as a society? What, what ought to be the kind of life that people pursue to be truly happy and, and truly free? Um, that I would argue is what he pointed out um, and he saw it, um, you know, I write in my chapter, he saw it as, as, a, as an immigrant to the West. And he is he's asked to give um, this commencement address. Most of the commencement addresses that they invited him to do, he would turn down. And finally, he did it for Harvard. And he's, he writes in his diary that what was mainly expected of me is to sing the immigrants ode to the great Atlantic force, fortress of liberty. And of course, he didn't do that. He spent most of that speech criticizing developments in the West and, and that scandalized people. But I think... He's absolutely right. The, what, he, what he had observed that led him to that conclusion in the four years from when he first escaped from the Soviet Union to um, 1978 when he gave the speech was um, just the culture, for example, of, he called it commercial chicanery, you know, of um, you know, all these publishers that would fight over his material, fight in the courts, over the, his books, over the rights to his books. And you know, drawing up these staggeringly one-sided contracts. And all they cared about was the fact that Solzhenitsyn is a famous writer and, you know, his material is going to make us money with no sense of the kind of moral purpose for which he had written his books, which is to alert the world to the horrors in the Soviet Union. Um, he saw it in the behavior of the press where even though they're um, free on paper, is a free press on paper, in fact, the kind of prevailing conformism prevents people from saying anything original. There's these narrow opinion corridors of what's acceptable. And so, and mostly it's a kind of um, underwritten by corporations who use their outlets to you know, protect their own agendas and, and preferences. Um, so that there's not really free thought in the West, even though on paper there is. Um, a kind of conformism among scholars that he noticed. And then he was even taken advantage of by like the contractor that he hired to build his house in rural Vermont. Um, and, and so he, that just made him sense that there's, that something's gone wrong with the West. And that has to do with the fact that um, it's, it's overweening rights culture failed to make a distinction between the classical account of freedom, which is freedom as what you ought to do and freedom for evil license really for evil. There's no distinction. As long as you, 
uh, you know, pursue your rights up to the limit of the law, maybe sometimes a little beyond the limit of the law. That's it. That's all you want in a society. And that's it, it, it left him kind of deeply dissatisfied and critical of the West. And as I said, he he got the 1978 version of getting ratioed in the sense that you know, the, almost the entire mainstream media savaged that speech at the time. The New York Times, the Washington Post. The one exception was George Will, the, the center-right columnist. Um, and um, I, I, I actually, I doubt that George, to, today's George Will would give the same reception because he's become a doctrinaire libertarian these days. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think has, has changed since, since that fateful day in 1978? Um, are, yeah. are we further down the line? We're further down the, these, these railway tracks or um, is, is this kind of a, was it a prebudition or was it already, uh, already a, a fact back then? I think that developments were in more embryonic stage, but uh, you, as you said, it's, it, it, it was so prescient um, and that um, all the developments that he identified have gone on hyperdrive. So for example, um, the fact that overweening corporate power um, and corporate domination of the media results in um, frankly censorship, um, has be that's become much more explicit. At the time it was just, you know, you had a few mainstream media outlets and they all enforced a kind of opinion parameter, opinion corridor. Um, but now you see it, not only do they do that, but also that they will directly ban people who, who violate those uh, parameters, including, you know, I work at the New York Post and in October we had, we, we broke a story, perfectly legitimate story about Hunter Biden and potential graft involving him and his father, then Vice President Joe Biden. and. The story remains undisputed. Uh, you know, the emails that we uncovered, Hunter has not disputed their authenticity. The Biden campaign hasn't. They just call it Russian disinformation against all evidence. It's, it's just, and so we, you know, we, our account was suspended for two weeks. Uh, the Facebook reduced circulation on the story. Twitter wouldn't allow you to not only not to post it in your public feed, but you couldn't send it as a direct message. Um, that is very, very, uh, it's, let me put it this way, that would not have surprised Solzhenitsyn, I would argue, because he saw that this kind of behavior happening in, a, in, a, in an embryonic form. Um, and you're talking about, by the way, you're talking about, you know, the New York Post is, is America's oldest continuously published uh, newspaper. Uh, it was founded by Alexander Hamilton. So <laughs> if they can, if we can be censored, then how free is um, how free is the free world? Yeah, but it it wasn't the state. I mean, if you have someone at like the the Cato Institute or you know American yeah. Enterprise, you know it's uh, this is this is fair game because it's it's not the the grubby hand of the state intervening in these things. But is is this uh, what what is the the nature of the state like compared to to big business at the moment? Um, they they seem a bit interchangeable to me. I mean, it's a, it's a completely formal, it's a, for, and Solzhenitsyn would say not only formal, but it's a legalistic distinction, mm -hmm. you know? Um, no, it's not a centralized state that censors you. Um, it's it's some, it's some Silicon Valley dweeb. And as I wrote in an essay a while ago, I said, you know, does the, does the Silicon Valley dweeb's Birkenstocks um, sandals taste any better than the military <laughs> commandant, you know, <laughs> boots? It's, it's still, you know, it's, it's such a legal distinction without any kind of uh, formal meaning. Because if freedom of speech at its best, um, um, as, an, as an institution, um, at its noblest, the idea that the press should be critical of, of asking questions, if it means anything, it means something on these platforms. Like I can, I live in Manhattan. I should, I could go outside and sort of bang my a drum and say, Hunter Biden is corrupt. Hunter Biden is corrupt. But I would like look like a nutter and it would have no effect. So it's on these privately owned platforms that freedom of speech um, at its best lives or dies. And it, it seems to be dying <laughs> um, on, on those platforms. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that seems to be the case. And um... Uh, another question I wanted to ask you is um, about this. It feels to me like there's kind of a convergence at the moment in, in this particular space. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you, you're you're quoting Andrea Dworkin in, in a you know ostensibly right wing book. You know something something's going on here, and I know. A well, lot I would say I would say traditionalist. Traditionalist, yeah. yeah. If it's something that would probably be you know 
if, if there was a conservative aisle in the library or at the bookstore, there's probably going to be more in, the, in that direction. Sure. Uh, but uh, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of crossover at the moment between thinkers that would traditionally be associated with the left. Um, yeah. You know, like Andrew Dorkin, probably, uh, you know, there's a lot of people reading Ivan Illich, you know, Georgia mm -hmm. Gambin is, is quite, you know, coming into to fashion. And I feel like to me, this is really heartening in a way because it does melt away a little bit of, of that distinction. But I'm curious, what, what what's your feeling about this new kind of post left space, the post liberal space that's, that's forming? And uh, I don't know, I feel like uh, we, we both spend a lot of time in there. But uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. is, is this a positive change? Are these people to be trusted? Absolutely, it's, it's <laughs> absolutely positive. I, that play, that space is my my jam, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love that space because um, I think it's based on a shared recognition that um, something is very very wrong in the West. It's almost dystopia like in the sense that I, I sometimes watch like a movie like Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It feels like we're heading there, um, that our account, for example, of gender and sexuality as this um, uh, completely fungible thing that you, where you can change your gender um, uh, is not too far from a kind of transhumanist yeah. dystopia. Um, and that Obviously, there's, there are feminists, for example, who recognize it as well, that the category woman for which they have fought and made legitimate gains um, is under threat from this, whatever it is, this Gnostic view of gender where it's, it's, it's purely a social construct. And at the same time, in a bizarrely self-contradictory fashion, gender is both a social construct, but also some people have a profound innate sense of gender that clashes with the bodies they receive from nature. Those two, I mean, which is it? But anyway, it's leading us to sort of a, a, a dark place. And in order for us to steer our civilization out of that dark space, uh, we first, I think, need to smash both the existing left and the right. And so I have lots of friends who are doing that on the left side. Um, uh, uh, I mean, fr friends, allies on, on Twitter, really, but that's where it all happens. You know, Amy, Therese, and, and, and Edwin Aponte at the Bellows, and, uh, and, and Glenn Greenwald, uh, Matt Taibbi. Um, and we're trying to do the same thing. It's a cohort of post-liberal conservatives are, in a way, trying to do the same thing on, on the right. But more than that, there's a kind of shared recognition that, um, you know, uh, the ideology we labor under, um, and I is not Marxism. You know, a lot of like, a lot of uh, conservatives, boomer age conservatives, when they encounter this stuff, they're like, yep, Marxism's back, it's the left. It's not, it's, it's actually very comfortable with corporate power, with, with uh, kind of neoliberal economic arrangements and is, is capable of accommodating them. And so it's something else. And um, a lot of it has to do with, um, frankly, class-based arrangements and, and, and what's upheld by these ideologies. Um, and so, yeah, I'm all for that kind of new realignment, that a lot, you know, and I'm, I'm actively seeking to, in concrete ways, to, to bring the, let's say, heterodox left, the post-liberal right together and put our heads together and work together in a concrete way beyond just retweeting each other. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely the, the, the next step, though. Uh, I feel like, you know, on Twitter, that's probably the, the most friendly space, you know, the, the, the e even more maybe than the kind of like the reactionary right circles, the, the, the post-liberal left, they, they're just, you know, uh, relaxed and, and, and having mm -hmm. fun <laughs> as well. Um, so b before I, I, I let you go, I want to ask you the question of the show, um, which is, do you have a thinker, uh, could be a writer, could be politician, what, whoever it was inspirational to you and in, in, in your you know, formation that you think is getting, um, you know, some, someone subversive that you think is not getting enough, enough of the spotlight that people should check out, that they should read more of? Sure, I will name one of my original red pills, who is the, um, the Spanish Mm, I would say reactionary is the right way to put it, a 19th century um, uh, Catholic thinker named Juan Donoso Cortez, 
who was a liberal into his 30s and then began to, he shifted the other way. So in that sense, I always, he's one of the ones I cite when people say, well, you used to be a kind of typical classical liberal. I'm like, so was Denoso Cortez. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would encourage people to check out Cortez. Okay. Yeah, I've 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 gotten this recommendation recently as well. From, oh, good. Okay. I'm yeah, good. from anonymous posters. On. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. the 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 bad side of Twitter. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I will check them out. Everyone, check it out. But also, uh, please do read the Unbroken Thread. Um, and if there's any any more information about where people can find it, what's coming up with the book, uh, please please let me know. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>